and cheer up, right? <laughs> this preemptive. Put your heart yeah. into it a little bit there, there. Hello. So you want obnoxious. No no woman has ever asked me to be obnoxious. I just want you to. This is your time, Larry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the one shot. Shine on, you one crazy shot. diamond. <laughs> You know, you need to put a laugh track with these because we're having a great time and, you know, <laughs> if it was good enough for Seinfeld, it should be good enough for us. Yeah, of course. Oh, I got one. <laughs> there we there go. There it is. <laughs> Hello, I'm Larry and this is Carter's Country. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm joined with Billy Carter here and uh, we're going to kind of just answer some questions so that you can get a chance to know us a little bit better learn a little bit about our backgrounds, how we got into the, you know, our love affair with guns, and uh, just talk about uh, just a few general topics for you. <laughs> okay, well, my name's Larry Holiday, and uh, my history with guns. Uh, my dad was a police officer. By the time I came along, guns had been in our house way before I was. <laughs> At a very young age, he started teaching me about guns. The first lessons I remember from him were about gun safety. He used his policeman voice <laughs> which meant uh, listen or else, mm. and, uh, and I listened. So that's kind of how it started. I remember first time I actually got to shoot a gun. It was a little 22 at a friend's farm up in Rusk. Felt like such a big shot. I was hooked at that <laughs> point. So I've, I've always had guns for hunting, you know, shooting for the fun of it. When I retired from my previous corporate life, uh, Carter's Country, and being around guns all the time just seemed like a natural fit. So. Right. My history with it basically goes from before I can remember to right here today. Hi, I'm Billy Carter. i uh, pretty much been in guns all my life. My parents purchased our first shooting facility when I was four years old. I started shooting a 22 rifle when I was probably seven or eight years old. Been very fortunate to spend really my lifetime uh, doing what I really love, and that's playing with guns a lot. <laughs> I still look to learn more and more about guns every day. I mean. It's amazing to, at this point in time that I would think I would know everything, but I don't. You know, I've shot, Lord knows, thousands of rifles, thousands of pistols, different kind of shotguns. I love hunting, I love fishing, I love sporting clays, I do extreme distance shooting, I love uh, handgun shooting. I love pretty much every parameter of the actual uh, gun world when it gets right down to it. And I look forward to spending the rest of my life involved in all of it. First gun I ever owned, when I was 10 years old for Christmas, I got a single shot 410. <laughs> like every other kid in Texas, I think. <laughs> that was right. my first gun. Man, I was so proud of that thing. It, I was such a big shot. I, got, I even got a little cleaning kit with it. <laughs> it was just, I mean, it just meant everything to me that my dad trusted me enough to, to have a gun at that point. That to me was a significant milestone in my 10 year old brain that I was growing up, mm -hmm. you know? It's no coincidence that my, uh, son's first gun and my grandson's first gun were also single shot 410. <laughs> so it's just kind of a family thing now and, and right. uh, I hope my uh, grandson carries that on you know whenever he gets uh, to having kids and it's time for their first gun I, I hope it's a single shot 410. It's just right. a, it was just the coolest thing I can't really even describe how much it meant to me to get that thing. Right quite like Larry's story you know my first gun that that I was uh, uh, given to shoot was it was a single shot 410 but truly the first gun that I ever got to really own I was actually 18 years old on my 18th birthday my dad called me back to his back office and I thought oh god I'm in trouble again <laughs> <laughs> and I, when I get back in the back there's three Weatherby rifles back when they used to come in styrofoam boxes and they actually had on the end of the box light medium or dark flavored wood and there's three guns there and he sat there he said which one of them stocks you like the best? And so, of course, I was kind of a dark wood kind of guy at that point in time, so I picked out the darkest, the darkest with the most figure that they had. And he, he said, okay, what kind of scope you want on top of it? He said, we'll, we'll go ahead and put a Leopold 2 after 8. Happy birthday. This is yours to keep now. Oh, man. That's it's cool. I still have it. it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely the <laughs> best experience I've ever had. Yeah. I still have that gun. I still shoot that gun. I've told everybody there's going to be a few guns I'm going to be buried with, and that will be one of the few I'll be buried with. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I completely understand that. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, my favorite gun that you know that's that's like asking somebody which one is their favorite kid I mean you know I've, I've got a favorite gun to shoot I've got the my favorite gun uh, to carry I've got my favorite gun uh, for sentimental reasons so that that there's a lot of layers to that for a 
for a gun guy like me. <laughs> um, I guess I would have to say, if I just went from the standpoint of shooting, which gun do I enjoy shooting uh, the most, it would be a, a 1911. I love the 45 caliber, the way the gun fits in my hand, the way it shoots and everything else. For, for sentimental values, I, I've got three different ones. One, my dad's Colt revolver that he bought when he got back from World War II and joined the police force. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously the sentimental value of that one is just incredible to me. I've got a double barrel shotgun that my late brother bought me one year for Christmas. Never been fired. I may never shoot it, honestly. It's just, mm -hmm. I look at it, I know what it is. Brings back so many memories for me, you know. Mm -hmm. I, and, and then another one, my son bought me a gun for Christmas a couple of years ago. It was completely unexpected. The adults in our family, we don't really spend a lot on each other for Christmas. We pour it all into the kids. Mm -hmm. But uh, he bought me a uh, Henry 308 lever action, the Long really? Ranger when it came out with that. Oh, yeah. And uh, the coolest thing about that was I didn't ask for it. I had made a passing comment about it on the way to the deer lease one time about how cool I thought a 308 lever action was. I thought mm -hmm. that was really a, a unique thing. And man, when I got it, it just, uh, it blew, just blew away, me huh? away. Yeah, because. <laughs> You know, as cheap as my son is about spending money <laughs> and the fact that I didn't really say, hey, buy me this. Right. It, it was really, it came from him. You know, there's no one, I can't answer that there's one favorite, but those for sentimental reasons and, and for the shooting experience of the 1911, I guess I would have to say it has to be a four-way tie. <laughs> <laughs> Here again, like Larry, it's going to be kind of hard to say one favorite gun. Um, I've got the little Legacy 20 gauge, done a lot of quail hunting with. I really love that shotgun. It's very lightweight. It's a very beautiful piece of wood on the gun. That'll be one of the ones that there again I'll be buried with. Um, I've got, like we talked about earlier, about the 300 Weatherby rifle. It's still one of my favorites as far as that my dad gave me by about 40 something years ago, basically. And then uh, as far as other guns go, I mean, I, I do a lot of AR shooting. I mean, I, I enjoy uh, 300 blackout shooting a lot. You know, kind of lighter recoil, fun gun to shoot, pretty accurate. Um, we do, like I said before, we do a lot of distance shooting also. I've got a 375 shy tech that we, that we try to stretch limits with and go out to two miles with on a regular basis, which I really enjoy shooting those guns also. It's, uh, and uh, there's a, like a 338 Lapua that I shoot on the regular also that I really enjoy shooting. Um, I, I just enjoyed a lot of different platforms in the actual rifles. I've got a 625 uh, Browning Sporting that I love to shoot sporting clays with. Um, in the handgun world, uh, Colt Python you know, revolvers is probably one of my favorites to shoot. I really start, I really kind of cut my teeth on one of those years and years ago. Um, there's just, there's just too many to mention. I yeah, mean, it's, it's, just, it's really a harder yeah. question than some people may realize. You know, I mean, there's not a one answer thing to I it. I mean, if you're in the guns, you're you're not into just one gun. You're typically into a lot of guns. More right. Than anything else, you know, there's not just one favorite. You have a you have a group of favorites. You yeah. Know? There, there's so many different categories for that. Right. I do not like that question. Because um, your wife's going to find out. Well, yeah, I, I'm trying to remember what's the most recent one she knows about. Yeah, yeah. And the, the why part of that is irrelevant because it's it's what I want, not what I need. Right, I mean, exactly. So, yeah, I do not like this question. Um, you got to leave that part in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, as long as your wife didn't see, it'll be okay. Oh, she watches them. Oh, does she? Yeah. It gives, she watches them because it gives her another chance to be critical of me and tell right. me what I'm doing wrong. So she loves them. Most recent was a SIG P365. All right. um, as far as why, my first question is why not? But uh, <laughs> I like the way it shot. It was the first of the kind of micro nines to where you mm -hmm. kind of get some high magazine capacity in a really small frame that, that still shoots well. I liked it and it gave me another concealed carry option and so right. the why was because it was a good gun and I was able to rationalize the reason I needed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's half the battle right there. That buddy. is, absolutely. <laughs> the other half is sneaking one in the house if you didn't tell her about it. But Never done that. I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I, I question that but you're the, my boss so <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just going to agree with you. <laughs> right. Good job, Blair. <laughs> I don't hear that often. <laughs> <laughs> My most recent purchase is the Christians and Arms 308 with that uh, 20 inch uh, carbon fiber barrel. The reason I purchased it, the reason I like the gun is because 
I am starting to get a little older now. And what? so weight matters. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it does. It really does. In more ways than one. It's not just a stat on the spec sheet of a gun anymore. Yeah, it's like, no. oh, that, that won't be so bad. You know, so, so when you think about walking or carrying or, you know, strapping anything on your back, getting on a four-wheel or so forth, that I really discovered that heavyweight rifles are, are not fun for a long period of time like that. Right. So this is going to be my new kind of go-to gun in a lot of ways. With 20-inch barrel, I'll be able to put my can on top of it. It'll still be a reasonable length and so forth and so on, kind of right. go from there. And you know, you mentioned it was a 308. I remember one time asking your dad, said if, if you had just one gun caliber you had to go with, what would it be? And 308 is what he said. And yes, um, it's a very universal caliber. It really is. You know, it, it's um, I just when you said 308, I thought back to that conversation. I was like, yep. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you do anything from deer to elk. Yeah, you know, really true. Absolutely. You think short of brown bear? <laughs> For me, uh, I hadn't been. You know, working at Carter's that long, I was behind the counter, and a, a guy was buying a, a pistol, and he just happened to be an FBI agent. <laughs> and uh, when he took out his wallet to to give me his driver's license to start the paperwork, you know, the badge was right there. And so we fill it all out, and like I do every other customer, I asked him, I said, "Do you have a license to carry?" <laughs> Because if you do, that means you don't have to submit the background check. You just fill out the paperwork and file it. I kind of already knew his answer because you've got an FBI badge in your pocket. Why do you need an additional license to carry a gun? Right. right. So he laughed. He goes, no, I never thought I'd really need one. And I <laughs> said, well, I said, the reason I ask is because we're going to have to submit the background check. You mm -hmm. know, thankfully, he was a good sport and just laughed. He goes, well, let's hope I pass. <laughs> <laughs> and I took him over to the counter and I was the one that input is background check and i was really when i hit the submit button i'm like man if this thing comes back anything other than approved i don't know how i'm gonna tell you yeah. <laughs> it, it, it came back approved but it, it was just funny just the whole experience his attitude and everything with it was so good so that was definitely probably the most fun i've ever had with a gun sale <laughs> probably one of my most favorite gun sale experiences in the national store uh, would be with one of our one of our customers that's unfortunately passed away now jim boyd he was a very very nice, super good man. He he loved hunting. He really enjoyed the outdoors. He and I really hit it off. Um, his first time he ever bought anything from me. I mean, we just became instant friends. Yeah. And, you know, and there's few people like that. Right. And you know, uh, he unfortunately passed away about three or four months ago back, maybe a little longer. But I mean, probably one of the biggest losses I've ever had in my life, besides of course my father. Yeah. Really, really super nice people. And it's not really, it wasn't just one sales experience with him, but every time it came in the store, it was a, it was a pleasurable experience. It right. was just good fun. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, you're right. There's so very few people that you get that feel from, and, and when you do, they really become special. Yep. Even, even if it's at a business transaction, yep. it's still the same, yeah. same feeling. Yep. Okay, let me preface this by saying that for me, <clears throat> funny and weird often intersect. <laughs> so... <laughs> this may not sound funny as yeah. much as it will sound weird, but a guy came into the store one day, and uh, and I do love all our customers. I really do. Mm -hmm. But this guy, he was wearing one of those Affliction shirts like the MMA guys wear. Right. Uh, it was about three sizes too small, <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing. I handed him the pistol. He pulled the slide back and locked it, was looking at it. At that point, it's a, this is an, just another customer, right? Okay. Well, he releases the slide and the slide slams home. And that's a sound, you know, that if you've ever watched movies, Hollywood loves that sound, mm -hmm. that and a pump shotgun. Right. You know, it just drives me crazy because there's so many reasons why that, in that part of the movie, why that wouldn't be the time you're releasing the slide right. or pumping the gun. But anyway, he does that. At that point, I don't know what happened. He looked over at the girl with, I guess his go-to, hey girl, look, pulled the slide back, released it again, Proceeded to do it about four more times, looking at her the whole time as if this was Trying to impress her, huh? Yeah, like he was handing <laughs> her a piece of jewelry or something, you know. And and I'm just sitting there, kind of amazed and watching this all, and trying not to laugh at the absurdity of it. And uh, finally, I couldn't take it. I said, "Well, at least we know the slide works," you know. And uh, and the girl kind of, you know, smiled a little bit. The guy, it either went over his head or he didn't hear me or whatever. I don't know. Right. Thankfully, he finally let the poor gun alone handed it back to me, didn't buy anything. And I began to wonder, did he just come in here to do that with her? Right. You know, I mean, it's a cheap date. It didn't cost him anything and, <laughs> you know, 
But anyway, that that was the uh, funniest slash weirdest customer that I ever had the pleasure of interacting right. with. Sounds pretty weird to me. <laughs> I, I, I wish it could have been on film because, it, you know, it would have gone viral on, on social media. It was just, right. man, it was something else. Right. Probably one of my weirdest slash funniest stories I've ever had uh, dealing with customers. I had the guy come in two or three months ago and he was, he was talking about distance shooting. And so, like I told you earlier, you know, we shoot guns out to two miles, and he, the guy apparently did not really know what he, what he was talking about, just from his conversations about how much elevation that was needed for a 6.5 Creedmoor to get to a mile. And he's sitting there telling me that he's got his, his 6.5 Creedmoor shooting at two miles. I said, so let me ask you a question, sir. How many MOAs does it take to get, you to, get your 6.5 to two mile distance? He rattled off like 200 minutes of angle, and I said, no, no, no. I said, look, dude, I said, we shoot distances out to two miles. I said, on a 6.5 Creedmoor would be long gone and dead in the ground before two miles. I said, you know, there's no way that it can get two miles out of it. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, well, fine. I have a ballistic computer in my actual desk, so I brought the ballistic computer out. I did the math through it. I said, sir, you'd have to have 400 inches of actual up upward motion in that scope in order for that thing to get there. I said, it's impossible. And so at that point in time, he kind of like shrugged his shoulders and turned his tail and went away. <laughs> Do you think he realized that it, you've set world records in distance shooting when he was talking to you? I was not, but I don't care about that. I just couldn't let it go though. <laughs> yeah, I know. At, at that point, you're like, you know, I could just I'm in it to win my it. head, but that's <laughs> right. Yeah, you've drawn a line here. And, yeah, yeah, here we go. <laughs> okay, for me, the gun range itself may be the one part of the Carter's Country Enterprise that I haven't worked in. I haven't actually worked out there as a range officer. And unfortunately, the craziest thing I've seen out there involved me, uh, <laughs> and not in a good way. A couple years ago, coming up on deer season, my son didn't have time, gave me my grandson's youth model 243 and said, would you make sure to sign it in for me? I haven't been a youth in a while. So I get it set up and I don't realize how close I'm getting to this scope as I'm trying to position this thing and get, I pull the trigger and I feel the scope hit me, you know, mm -hmm. between the eyes. My first thought wasn't that hurt. My first thought was, I hope I'm not bleeding because there's about five coworkers standing around me now <laughs> watching and I, I can't make a mistake. Right. And then I slowly feel the unmistakable warm trickle <laughs> <laughs> running down the side of my nose I'm like yeah I'm bleeding <laughs> I have a plan my plan is I'm gonna hurry up get this thing sighted in they're all behind me I will pick up the gun exit right and go out straight to the parking lot right well as I'm adjusting the scope one range officer who remained nameless Oki uh, <laughs> leans forward and sees the blood well being a compassionate you know, caring guy that he is, he announced it to everyone that I was bleeding. <laughs> Between the humiliation of doing that in front of friends, the humiliation of getting scope cut by a 243 of all things, mm -hmm. uh, and then of course one of them runs to get the first aid kit, everyone has something to say, not very supportive. Uh, they come out, they patch me up like I'm in a prize fight or something, you know. Easily my most memorable, bizarre, funny event was uh, doing something that stupid while a bunch of people standing around watching me who knew mm -hmm. I should know better. Yeah. So that <laughs> That's always when it happens that way. 100%. <laughs> it's like I it, I was, you know, I've never felt traumatized at a gun range before, but I left that day going, well, that couldn't have gone much worse. <laughs> <laughs> kind of something similar to yours, but I didn't have the audience that you had. For, fortunately, I didn't have the audience <laughs> that you had. Um, this was several years back. I had the gentleman uh, brought a black power rifle in for sight in, which, you know, I hadn't had that much experience with black power rifles, but I've shot them before, I've sighted them before, not that big a thing. This is when they, when they came out with the pellet, like the powder pellets. Right. And so it made it a whole lot easier. So I started at 50 yards, get it on paper with two rounds, and then I moved back to 100 yards, and then you also go from two pellets to three pellets, because that's gonna be your true hunting load. I do that, my first shot's pretty, pretty close to 100, and so I'll get down, load up, do it all over again, and I, I get down behind the gun for, for my fourth shot, and when I, when I squeeze that thing off, the actual gun ends up in the air like this. <laughs> Made one, and I, I 
I mean, and it, and it hit me in the face. The, you know, the scope hit me in the face, and I was just like, I was dazed, and I, my my shoulder was like like screaming in pain. It, and so I got the gun back down the bench, and I, what in the world just happened here? And I'm looking, I'm looking, I saw my ramrod. It's not here. <laughs> Let me guess where it was. <laughs> yes. In my haste and hurriness, I left the ramrod inside you, the barrel with three pellets of black powder. So <laughs> you turned it into a hybrid black powder rifle bow and arrow when oh that, you sent Lord. that rod hurtling down range. Oh my <laughs> Lord. And I, I, was, I was so embarrassed and I was so hurting. And this was in the evening and the guy was coming to come pick the gun up the next morning going to hunt in Colorado. So he, I had to... The only thing problem is I'm sitting there going like, oh my God, I have got to shoot this thing some more. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna dance again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but luckily, the fourth, like the fifth and sixth shots were pretty close to where they need to be, or actually where they need to be actually. Yeah. And so you know, I, I was able to call it done, but I've never experienced anything like that in my entire life. Yeah. Within a day, my arm was black and blue. This. I couldn't shoot for almost a week because of that stuff. It was yeah, the, crazy. The, the, the level of experience and expertise you bring out there the number of guns you've shot, having something unexpected happen when you pull the trigger had to just blow your mind. Oh, craziness. It was nuts. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. I wish I could have seen that. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people wish they could have seen it. But luckily, like I say, it just happened to be a slow eater and nobody was there. Yeah. I mean, I went right to the bathroom, had one little scratch in my nose when it bounced off my nose, and I took care of that, and yeah. nobody knew a single thing about it. Yeah, mine didn't work out quite so well. <laughs> I, th I think my, my favorite hunting story didn't have to do with my most successful hunt or most majestic Mm -hmm. setting or anything at all uh i was a young teenager and went on a hunt with my older brother and my dad uh, my dad was much more of a fisherman than he was a hunter but so it wasn't that often that the three of us went hunting together mm -hmm. but my brother had a uh, lease up in goldthwaite texas and we went up there to hunt i i got my first deer mm -hmm. my dad you know he didn't like i said he didn't really hunt that much anyway my brother didn't get anything that morning and so not only did I get my first deer and all the great, you know, emotions and feelings I, I got with that, I got it in front of two guys I idolized. You know, mm -hmm. by that point, my brother was back from Vietnam. He was a fireman. Uh, you know, my dad was a cop. He had been in World War II. And here I am with these two guys, and I got a deer, you know. Mm -hmm. I wish I could have appreciated it then the way I do now, right. you know. But but that had to be my, my number one hunting trip. The way I felt about them... The fact it was my first deer, the fact they didn't get one, that part sounds kind of selfish, but, <laughs> but just all of that made right. it, you know, knowing that that year or, you know, Christmas or wherever, whenever we were sitting there eating venison, mm -hmm. everybody was going to know that was my deer, right. you know, and yeah, it was, that was just the best. That's part, of, part of that family thing, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, my, Back to my son's first deer, my grandson's first deer, those were fantastic too, mm -hmm. but, you know, with my dad and brother not being here anymore, that one's kind of locked away in the vault for me. Right. Mm -hmm. cool. Probably my best hunting experience is actually was when I went to Africa when I was in Tanzania on a six day safari over there and we were hunting Cape Buffalo. We came upon a herd of Cape Buffalo, probably 400 animals, uh, about 800 yards out where there's some rolling hills up to where the herd was. And so basically we started, you know, started with you know, first 100 yards crouched and then we got right. down our hands and knees. Oh man, and then like really the stalking. Last, yeah. yeah. And then so we finally get, we're, you know, we're out there and grass is about this high from where we get a little closer to. So, you know, we're about, we finally work our way to about a hundred yards from the actual herd. The PH is in the front, the other guy's back in the back. And, you know, like PH pulls up, he kind of nudges me to come around to him. And, and he, there's a group of three old buffs out to the side. He said, does you see that group of three? I said, yes, sir. He, he says, you're gonna shoot the one on the, shoot the one on the right. I said, okay, cool. That's how we're gonna do this. He says, you're gonna catch your breath right now. We're gonna stand up, sh put the shooting sticks up, and you're gonna shoot that bull. I said, you know, we're like a hundred yards and we got buffalo all around us. <laughs> a lot of big animals. A lot, a, lot, a lot of meat on the hoof hanging around. And so, you know, and we're basically in the middle of nowhere. And so yeah. he said, okay, you ready? I said, yeah, great. So we stand up, the buffs just kind of look at us to begin with. And so I put throw up the shooting sticks, I get on, get on the right bull, put a hole in him, and he just kind of looks like, okay, what was that? Oops. So, so the guy said, hurry up, hurry up, put it in the shell, put it in the shell. 
put some more lead into them. Because your first round of dangerous game is always going to be a soft point build because you want to create the most muzzle shot to hit, knock them down. Any round in your magazine, after that's all going to be full metal jacket. That way you could just poking holes. Piercing, yeah. So the bull starts moving away. He's kind of angling away. So I put the second round in the right rear quarter and it actually flipped him. And I thought, well, pfft, this deal's done. <laughs> the guy said, load up. <laughs> By that time I look over that buff got up, he's run yeah. off, he's off in the brush. He's like, oh, he said, man, this is not going to be pretty. I said, this is going to, this is going to be a great experience for you. You realize? I said, no, I don't know about that. <laughs> so anyway, we play cat and mouse with Buffalo back and forth. We, we get within about hundred yards of him, put a hole in him. We, then he runs off, we get back and forth. So finally at the, uh, the grand finale of all this, we, were, we get back to him and he's standing about 60 yards broadside to us with his head cocked back looking looking over his shoulder at us. And so we're standing there and we're, I'm kind of huffing and puffing. He said, get your breath. I said, well, what's he doing? He says, he's judging range right now. I said, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> he's judging range and nobody, when you get close enough so you can charge. I said, well, we, we don't want to go through all that. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. And so the only shot I had was because his head was, he was standing broadside and his head was turned around, was through the actual loop in the horn. Yeah, I had to shoot through the loop in the horn. <laughs> And first, the PH wouldn't let me do it. And I said, come on, come on, coach, let me have it. <laughs> I said, I'm calm down. We've, heard, we've been running about 1,000 yards right now. My yeah. mark press from is gone. <laughs> I'm pretty much calm. I just want to call this deal done. So finally, it's about two minutes of coaxing. I said, just let me finish him off this way. And so finally, he said, okay, go ahead. He said, it's on you if you hit the horn. I said, yeah, I got it. And so poke shot, roll him over, and done deal. That was it, man. That's a lot of pressure, not only getting attacked, but it's kind of funny that the dynamic shifted there at the end to where he had all the holes in him, but you guys were in pretty big danger. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a lot. there have been several people killed over the years, I'm sure, and after yeah, from that I, kind of stuff. Like. I can understand that being your most memorable favorite hunt, right, for sure. It was. Okay, this one I'm going to need a minute because it actually ends up at a Sonic in Galveston, Texas, <laughs> and I'll explain. Uh, back in the late 90s, I had a buddy that... Uh, he, he was a guy that all he did was duck hunt. He doesn't fish, he doesn't do any other hunting. He is a duck hunting machine. And he invited me to go hunting teal with him at the start of teal season, which is very hot in Texas at the start of teal season. You know, me, I hear the word hunt, I'm like, sure. You know, mm -hmm. did not ask any of the particulars, think about this at all. Where we were hunting is this little godforsaken piece of real estate known as Goat Island. <laughs> It's in Bolivar off the Intercoastal Canal. You've got, mm -hmm. I think, East Bay behind it. You've got the Intercoastal here. Goat Island is right between the two. So, you know, I leave the house in plenty of time to get there, and still, it's still dark. Early 30. <laughs> yeah, early 30, right. So get down there, and like I said, I didn't ask nearly enough questions. And we have to cross the Intercoastal to get to this island, and he's got this, like, maybe 12 foot John boat powered by a trolling motor. And we're load all the gear in there, you know, the decoys, everything else. And we've got to cross, cross the intercoastal. And if, if, for those of you that don't know, the intercoastal is what megaton barges use to go up and down the Gulf Coast. <laughs> so like a, a game of Frogger, we've got to get <laughs> our little John boat, but you know, make sure there's no barges get our John boat across the other side. That's, so that's when I was first realizing this may not be a my good thing. idea. <laughs> you have to pull the boat high enough up on the island so that when a barge come by, the waves don't wash it back in the coastal <laughs> and you're there forever. Till whenever. <laughs> yeah. So we do all that. I'm already, you know, I'm sweating. It's not even daylight yet. I'm sweating. And, and the mosquitoes, which I think could carry away a small dog down there on the <laughs> coast are, are in full force. And now we got to walk to the blind. Well, Goat Island, if you just looked at it, you would think it was a uh, snake farm. I mean, <laughs> everything about this screams snake, and I hate snakes. So now we've got to walk through this smelly mud and muck to try to get to her. And, and David is so into duck hunting and thinking all of this is cool, uh, points out some gator tracks <laughs> to just to you know, enhance the experience for me. Right. Well, we get there, we get to the blind. I'm thinking, finally, we can rest. No, sir. You got to wait out there and put out your decoy. Yeah. So we do all that, get back up in the blind. I'm exhausted. I'm miserable. Um, I, I don't know how much blood I've lost yeah, from the mosquitoes. mosquitoes yeah. You know, we had one patch of 
flock of teal fly over us mm. the entire time. One. Mm -hmm. We managed to get three birds out of it. Right. And then you got to go out there, pick up the decoys, and do it all back the other right. way. Except now it's 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at that point, all I cared about was surviving, yeah. not dying from a gator <laughs> attack, snake bite, getting hit by a barge. So we get back. And I, I go back, I catch the ferry across to Galveston. I'm starving. So I pull into a Sonic there. And, you know, I've already had a terrible day. Right. I get to this Sonic, roll down my window, place my order in a little deal. Like a magnet, this homeless guy on his bike sees me and then pedals over, gets <laughs> off the bike and starts walking to the truck. Well, I'm in no mood for conversation yeah. or anything. I said, no, just no. I don't know if he's asking for money or yeah. what. I'm just like, no. He gets furious. Oh, really? So he, oh yeah, he's he's standing about twenty five. He's about twenty five yard feet maybe away uh -huh. from where I'm at, and starts challenging me to a fist fight. <laughs> Loud. So everybody in his Sonic's looking at me. Yeah. I'm sitting there. My window's open because you're at Sonic, and that's where they bring. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sitting there like seriously. <laughs> <laughs> the he's got a basket on the front of his bike. He pulls out one boxing glove and puts it on. <laughs> it's just and so i'm just sitting there like this is all surreal to me now like this whole trip has been a thing into the twilight zone or something right. you know i i feared for my life the entire hunt i'm miserable and now a uh, homeless guy threatened. wants to <laughs> box you. with one glove <laughs> between us one glove and i'm just sitting there and of course the, the waitress poor girl she's bringing my food out looking over her shoulder at him the whole time yeah. i throw her the money i don't know how much i tipped her <laughs> i got the bag and took off and the whole way home, I'm thinking, that's the last hunting trip, duck hunting trip of my life. <laughs> and uh, it has been. Done and done, and done huh? <laughs> One and done. <laughs> and for you duck hunters, no offense, it's a yeah. great sport. I know a lot of great hunters that are very passionate about it. That was my one experience with duck hunting, and I'm not really thinking that's a game I want back into. It's not really the worst hunting trip, but it was the worst scenario I went through. The, the, end, the end goal was still there, but uh, uh, we went Neil guy hunting down in South Texas at, outside of Cerrito on the King Ranch years ago with, with some friends we had a guide and so the way we hunt them basically was like you spot them and then you you know stalk them up stalk them, and yeah. so you know we we spotted the bull first morning made a stalk on them didn't get a hold of them. early afternoon we spotted another bull we get we make another stalk and part of the preface of the story is my best friend is sitting in the truck kind of overseeing because it's like where where the truck is at he can sit in this like this raised raised rack and he can kind of watch the scenario of us tracking this so forth and so on. So anyway, we walk up 50 yards and we see where the actual bull, where, where the bull nug guy's at, and then we make a plan, make another stalk. We keep cat and mouse, and we get to about 75, 80 yards away. And so I thought our little uh, guide said, wait here. So I hunkered down, I was kind of on, like on one knee, and so he takes off. He's going up, 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 up. He gets up about 40 yards, and you can see him physically turn his head, and he's talking, you know. And I'm going, who the hell is he talking to? <laughs> and so all of a sudden, he turned around, and he looks, and he goes, what are you doing? <laughs> Get up here. I felt about that big at that point in time in life. <laughs> anyway, the story ended well. We ended up getting the new guy. Awesome. But the problem was my buddy saw it all happen. That is a problem. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like still me on the range. Day, it's, yeah. He still to this day reminds me, what a doofus you sitting there and he's going, where are you at? <laughs> you know, that that's kind of one of the magic things about hunting is, I mean, you've had all these experiences. You've hunted in Africa. You've hunted all over North America and everything else. And if you just have one little misstep, you have just made a fool of yourself in front of Yep. All these other hunters and everyone else, and it's something you never forget, but it's something, <laughs> as as we're proving right now, you never quit laughing about it either, no. man. It's, <laughs> you have to laugh at yourself, what I've always been told. And that's part of the challenge <laughs> when you're hunting. If you're hunting with a lot of friends and, and you know relatives, things like that, in your mind the whole time is like, don't mess up, don't mess up, don't yeah. mess up. Because you know everybody's just yeah. poised like a Wait. rattlesnake waiting for that misstep that, that they can seize on and mm -hmm. you will be the campfire fodder that night that's yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> all right well if you've made it to the end of this video thank you and i hope you had as much fun watching it as we've had making it uh it's good so good to sit around and talk about the memories like this feel free to comment below 
uh, on any of your thoughts about the video. And also, if you'd like to see more of these videos in the future, please feel free to also include any questions you would like us to address, and we'll be happy to uh, include it. Remember, if you've ever shopped, shot, or hunted with us, you're already a part of the Carter's Country family. Until next time, adios. adios.